Good morning. Good morning. Uh, please join with me in a prayer for God's wisdom and understanding. Lord, as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word, we ask that you grant us wisdom and understanding. May our time spent in your word grow in us love for you and your people and bring you glory. Amen. Our unison reading this morning comes from uh, the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. That can be found in your pew Bible on page 79 of the New Testament. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus contains a reversal of fortunes in the next world, where we seem to be rewarded for good works and punished for evil. The greater surprise comes in the dialogue between the rich man and Father Abraham. The rich man asks that Lazarus be sent to convey a special warning to his five brothers who are still alive. The answer is that they already have the, su the sufficient message of scripture. Those who are unmoved by the message of scripture will not be convinced by a miracle either, even by a resurrection. Jesus seems to warn us about our indifference to God's word and to other people. As God loves all his children, so should we. Please join with me in reading Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like me things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you can, cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, The Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they convince even if someone rises from the dead. The word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. This can be found in your pew Bible, New Testament, page 210. We are to use our wealth to do good. We must be ready to share. Don't forget that as a Christian, you are a member of a fellowship, a community that looks after one another. Every time we could give, could help, and do not, lessens the wealth laid up for us in the kingdom to come. Every time we give, share, and help increases the riches laid up for us when this world comes to an end. Wealth is not a sin, but it's a responsibility. If we use our resources to bring help and comfort to others, in becoming poor, we really become richer. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Please follow along as I read 1 Timothy Chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Of course, there is a great gain in godliness combined with contentment. 
For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made. The good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the presence of God, who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them to be haughty, or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When we first moved here to Pensacola and have a house over by the airport, I noticed every plane that took off and flew overhead. Whether at home or here at Trinity, every plane, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. After a while, I didn't hear them as much. And after a while, I really didn't pay attention at all. If I did hear it, I'd go, oh, that's the 610 flight to Atlanta. It just became routine. And walking through the house, I noticed things that need to be fixed or painted or cleaned or picked up or whatever. And if you walk by them enough, you don't notice them as much. And I could tell her, okay, I'm going to get around to it. You don't have to nag me every six months or so. I'll get it fixed. It wasn't until I made an intentional decision to make fix things and made a list that the projects actually got accomplished. We can grow so accustomed to something, we don't even notice it anymore. We must see the need before we respond to the need. Once there was a rich man who lived in luxury, Jesus said, and a beggar named Lazarus lay at his gate every day, covered with sores and scabs and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. And the dogs came and licked his sores. <laughs> what an image. Do you think the rich man saw Lazarus sitting there every day in that condition? Well, of course he did at first, but if you walk by it every day, before long, it just becomes routine. And, and maybe it became, it's as if Lazarus wasn't even there for the rich man. Occasionally, we need a wake-up call to somebody else's condition and how we might help meet their needs, because there are always people outside our gate, in our community, in our world. Some are right under our nose, at home, at school, at work. We pass by them every day. Some need financial help. Some just need our love and encouragement. Some might need a handshake. Some might need a prayer. Some might need somebody to listen. They need our wisdom. They might need our example. We might have been someplace and been through something they're now facing. They need our attention. They need our time. Some of them need a relationship with Jesus Christ. The problem is their needs go unfulfilled if we don't even look at them and notice them. 
So in the parable, the story, both men die and their situations are reversed. Lazarus, who had suffered so in this life, now goes to heaven. The rich man goes to Hades, goes to hell. But he can see Lazarus on the other side with Abraham. He can see and notice Lazarus at last. Too bad he never noticed him before. Before you can respond to a need, you have to see the need. And who's begging now? The rich man's begging now. He begs for mercy. Then he begs for water. Send Lazarus just to dip his tongue and uh, his, his finger in the water and touch my tongue, just quench my thirst. But Father Abraham said, that's not possible. That, that's not how it works. He can't get to you. You can't get to us. When you were, were alive, you had everything, and Lazarus had nothing. You didn't help him then. Why should he help you now? Well, then I beg you, still begging, at least let him send him to my brothers to warn them so they'll not end up like me here. They can still repent before it's too late. No, they've already had the prophets. They've had Moses. They've had the church. They've had everything they need. They want to pay attention to that. They're not going to pay attention to them now. Nothing's going to change their mind now. Wait, what? Abraham refuses to let this rich man warn his brothers before it's too late so they won't end up like him? Yes. If they won't hear the truth of God's word now, and if they can look at the sorrow and the pain and the suffering and the troubles of people around them and feel nothing and do nothing, do nothing to help, do nothing to change things, then, then nothing's going to convince them now. Convince them about what? Convince them to care for people in trouble? Convince them about living a righteous life? Uh, convince them about faith in Christ? Uh, you know, Jesus doesn't say. Parables don't answer the questions they raise. They raise a situation, they raise a question, and we have to reply and respond with the answer and what we're going to do about that. So the parable's asking you, do you notice needy people? Do you notice the people in your home and what they need? Do you notice people at work and what they need? Do you, do you notice people at school? Do you, do you notice the people around you and what they're going through? Do you listen to them? Do you see their need? How might you respond if you saw their need? Because ultimately this, this parable is not about giving handouts to the poor, and, and it's not about heaven and hell and what they're like or or at what happens to us after we die, the parable is really recognizing that everyone, rich or poor, has value and is worthy of your attention. Everybody is a child of God. And God loves them as much as God loves you. And God values them as much as God values you. The gap is between what God expects of us and what we do with what we have. We create this gap, this chasm between us in the parable. When we think that the people receiving our gifts and goods are less valuable than we are, and perhaps they should thank us more, or that they're worth less of our respect, or they're less than me. This parable is about repentance and how we use our wealth and comfort and what we have in our resources and how our own comfort can blind us to the needs of others and blind us to our own condition. You know, even in hell, the rich man is still focused on himself. 
and his own comfort. Even in the torment, he could not bring himself to see Lazarus as an equal partner in God's grace. He doesn't even speak to Lazarus, would you help me? He says, Abraham, tell him to dip his finger and bring me some water. Lazarus, tell him to go to my brothers. Even still, he sees Lazarus as an underling, a servant, someone there to do his bidding. And even in death, the rich man was still focused on himself and his own comfort, his own needs, which likely we are when you're surrounded by fire and torment. But preacher Joanne Taylor wrote, the rich man is the picture of what it looks like not to repent. He hadn't changed his ways yet. The price of his non-repentance was not just having to endure the flames of hell. He had to endure seeing Lazarus in comfort in the embrace of Father Abraham across the gap on the other side of the chasm that he could not get across to have the same. Joanne Taylor suggests that the gap, this this chasm between us, was one the rich man had created, and that he made it wider and deeper every time he walked by Lazarus by his gate and did nothing to help him. So how do we close that gap? How do we close the chasm? that separate us from people when we do not see their needs or or not do anything to respond to other people's needs. And I'm not talking about just financial support and generous offerings and our mission partners and, and agencies around the world. I'm talking about when we are indifferent to other people and not even caring to notice what they're going through. Whether people outside our gates or people even closer to us, at home, our neighbors, our community, our our co-workers, our classmates, the people in our organizations that we see on a regular basis. And when you ask people or they ask you, how you doing? Fine, fine, fine. Which counselors tell you fine stands for feelings ignored, not expressed. How you doing? Fine. Don't pry, don't pry, don't, don't get to know me, or I don't want to do the same to you, so I'm fine. Feelings ignored, not expressed. Well, you know, I'm kind of down today. Oh, really? Hmm, I don't want to get into that. I'm really feeling very needy right now. I'm very upset. I'm very concerned. I'm very, I'm hurting. Oh, oh really? Hmm. Really didn't want to get into that. Just want to know, how you, how you doing? Well, to tell you the truth, so when you see somebody, ask them, how are you doing? Fine. No, really, how are you doing? I want to engage. I want to see and know your need if I can meet it. The chasm that separated Lazarus and the rich man in the next world is is but an extension of the gate that separated them in this world. That gate that separates us and divides us, that, that isolates us, even kind of insulates us against the needs of others. It's not a condition of circumstance or or of classes, rich and poor, black and white, Christian, non-Christian, any other category you want to add that we separate ourselves by. The gate is a condition of our heart. It's a condition of compassion. The gate exists within us before it comes between us. And only one bridge can connect us to people on the other side of the chasm. Only one, one bridge can connect us with God who's across the chasm from us because of our sin that separates us. That bridge is Jesus Christ. When we stand at the cross, we see that we are no better than others, and our sins are not better than other sinners, or that their sins are worse than our sins. Sin is sin, but Jesus loved us enough to die for us to close the gap between us and God so we could have access to God. He becomes the bridge across the chasm that we could not traverse by ourselves. And Jesus helps us to see others as he sees them. When you see people through Jesus' eyes, you see them as people who also have needs and concerns and fears and joys and and questions and the whole life that we share, they share. And Jesus wants us to see them as he sees them, 
precious children of God who have needs just like we have and want us to see that all of us stand before God in the need of God's grace and that every one of us is a beloved child of God, valued and cherished by God. That's who you are. That's who we all are. So that means from time to time we have to examine our own selves and see what separates us from others, what separates us from ourselves, our, our best self, uh, what, what separates us from our enemies, what separates us from those we love. What are your gates? We are separated and divided in America these days. Think about what gates we live with, fear, resentment, anger, greed, distrust, prejudice, loneliness, apathy, addictions, hurts, resentments, broken promises, envies, cynicism, you, you, you name it. You know your gates. We all have them. But that is not how God intends us to live. Gates destroy relationships. God heals relationships. Gates hinder us doing God's work in God's kingdom. God prospers the work of his kingdom. Jesus died to make us holy, and the Holy Spirit enables us to live as God intends. And every time we love our neighbors as ourselves, every time we love our enemies and, and pray for those who persecute us, every time we see and treat one another as a child of God, created in the image of God, the gates are opened a little bit more, and the chasms are filled and we have access to one another. Every time we share our tithes and offerings, every time we share the bread and the cup, every time we volunteer to make something happen for the good of others, every time we share an encouraging word or a handshake or a hug or a greeting or a welcome, we acknowledge one another as valued and loved children of God, worthy of one another's attention because you have talents and abilities and passions and, and ideas and money and influence and, and creativity and, and compassion that our world needs. You have answers that other people need and are looking for. You have resources and the influence to make life better for others around you. You have opportunities to listen, really listen. So how are you doing? No, really. How are you doing? Some older adults were eating at a restaurant one day, and one of them asked, if you could turn back the clock and relive your life over, what would you do differently? And one of the ladies said, you know what I would like? I would like to be 18 years old again and know what I know now. At this point, the waitress who had been clearing the table stopped put down her tray and looked at the lady and said, I'm 18, what do you know? <laughs> People all around you, young, old, need the benefit of your experience. They need for us to listen, really listen to them without judging because then communication can really take place. Listen before speaking. Seek first to understand before seeking to be understood. You must see the need and understand the need before you can truly respond to the need. But when you see the need but don't fail to respond, open the gates, you fill the chasms. Because 1 Timothy 6 charges us who are rich in things not to be proud or haughty or think I'm too good or I don't need that, I don't need you, not to put our security in things alone because God is our security and the God who gives us all things gives them for us to share with those around us. 
And God blesses us so that we may bless others. And when we give and share and benefit other people, we lay up treasures in heaven where the true joy is to be found. It, it's not a sin to be wealthy, but wealth brings responsibilities. And if we use our money and our possession only to serve ourselves and to protect our pride, protect our situation, we impoverish our souls. But if we recognize wealth and resources and possessions and comforts and joys and influence and opportunities as gifts from God and use our blessings to help others, we really become richer for it ourselves. So ask God how you may bless someone this week. Offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice and ask God to use you to bless others. It may be a Lazarus. It may be the rich man. It may be a peer, a colleague, who knows? Not just to use your money and your resources, but to use your experiences, to use your witness, to witness what you have come to know. Your faith journey, Bill, what brought you here and what a church family means to you and what the resources in your life have brought you joy and how you can share it with others how you can serve your community, how your, your education, how your friendships, how your connections, how your curiosity and your creativity, anything you've got, your emails, your text messages, your, your phone calls, your, your notes of encouragement to other people. What could you use to bless somebody this week who needs to be noticed? And ask God how you can celebrate your gifts and material goods to bless others and you expand your circles of influence from home to Trinity to Pensacola to the community and to the world. God has provided everything we need to do God's work. That was Father Abraham's point of not sending Lazarus to the rich man's brothers. Abraham was not denying them anything they already had. And he's saying this is already sufficient if they would just pay attention. The word proclaimed by Moses and the prophets, the word embodied in Jesus Christ, opens gates and fills the chasms. Jesus is our example in the image of what God created us to be and to become as his children. So my encouragement is allow God to work in you this week. Be the Lazarus call that somebody else needs to wake up and see the need. Discover God's calling to compassion and to faithfulness, and to generosity, and discover the ways that you can make a difference, a lasting difference, with your time, with your talents, with your resources, with your attention. And to God be the glory. Amen. God, it's all that easy, isn't it? Oh, but it's all that hard when we really see. But give us wisdom and give us courage to respond to the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen. And if the elders would come forward.